Apollo Project Chapter 5 On a small, dying town lies in a distant world, teetering on the edge of oblivion. Its once vibrant streets now echo with a haunting emptiness, its inhabitants desperately clinging to the fading remnants of hope as they battle to survive in a world that has mercilessly abandoned them. Water and food, once abundant, have become scarce commodities in this town on the brink of collapse. The inhabitants, trapped with no escape, are not just desperately clinging to the fading remnants of hope, they're gasping for it. Their struggle for survival in a world that has all but abandoned them is not just palpable. It's suffocating, their despair hanging heavy in the air, casting a shadow over their weary souls. But amidst the desolation, a beacon of hope emerges in the form of Alex, a wanderer with a heart of gold and a determination to make a difference. Armed with knowledge and ingenuity, he sets out to offer the townspeople a chance at salvation. Guiding them to an old junkyard littered with the remnants of forgotten spacecraft, Alex unveils a bold plan to transform their fortunes. With resourcefulness and perseverance, he teaches them the art of cultivation, showing them how to coax life from the barren soil and extract precious water from the parched earth. As the town, once desolate, begins to bloom with newfound abundance, a wave of gratitude swells in the hearts of its inhabitants. Once weighed down by despair, their spirits are now lifted by the promise of a brighter future. The celebrations are not just filled with joy and hope. They're bursting with it, but amidst the revelry, whispers of distant lands and forgotten kin stir in the people's minds, igniting a longing for reunion and belonging. Moved by their plight, the townspeople turn to Alex with a heartfelt plea, asking him to accompany them on their journey to find their lost brethren. But to their surprise, Alex declines, his gaze fixed on the horizon as he speaks of a place he calls home. He explains that his journey is not yet over, that he still has more to do, more places to see, and more hearts to touch. His selflessness in this moment is not just admirable, it's awe-inspiring. For Alex, the search for belonging is not confined to a single town or planet. It is a quest that transcends boundaries and spans galaxies, driven by an unyielding yearning to find a place where his heart can truly rest. And though he may walk alone, his legacy lives on in the hearts of those he has touched, a testament to the power of compassion and the enduring spirit of hope. Alex could never remember from one venture to another. His will was being touched. Alex drank a cold beer mug while walking back to his space, which has now become a black fighter. Alex boarded the ship, and it recognized him as Lieutenant Commander. Alex laughed and said, so I've been promoted, whatever. The ship lifted from the ground and asked, where to Lieutenant Commander? Alex said home. A voice said, welcome, Lieutenant Commander, Sir Boss. Go forward to your destiny, the darkness took Alex into the black space of time. Aboard the Apollo 1, there was a big celebration and thousands of military personnel were in attendance. The celebration was about Lieutenant Serbos's promotion to Lieutenant Commander and the first military officer to die in the line of duty. As Sandra, Alex's mother, reflects on the loss of her son in the call of duty, her heart aches with a mixture of pride and sorrow. With a trembling voice and tear-streaked eyes, she shares her thoughts on the sacrifice he made for others and the indelible mark he left on the world. My dear Alexandra begins, her voice wavering with emotion. He was always such a brave soul from the very beginning. Even as a child, he possessed a sense of duty and honor that set him apart. Memories flood Sandra's mind with each word, painting a vivid portrait of her son's unwavering courage and selflessness. She recalls the day he decided to follow in his father's footsteps and join the ranks of those who served, driven by a sense of purpose that burned brightly within him. As a mother, it was hard to watch him go off into the unknown, to face dangers I could scarcely imagine Sandra continues, her voice trembling with emotion. But I knew that he was doing what he believed was right, what he was destined to do. As Sandra speaks, her words carry the weight of a mother's love and pride, mingled with the pain of loss that lingers in her heart. She recounts the moments of joy and laughter they shared, as well as the moments of fear and uncertainty that gripped her soul during his time away. And then came the news Sandra whispers, her voice barely above of a whisper. The news that shattered my world and left me feeling lost and alone. My dear Alex, taken from me in the blink of an eye, gone but never forgotten. 
Yet, even in the depths of her grief, Sandra finds solace in the knowledge that her son's legacy lives on. She speaks of the lives he touched, the hearts he inspired, and the difference he made in the lives of others. He may be gone from this world, but his spirit lives on in the hearts of those he touched, Sandra concludes, her voice filled with quiet resolve, and though the pain of his loss may never fully fade, I take comfort in knowing that he gave his life in service to others, a true hero till the end. As Fleet Admiral Bishop Serbos, Alex's father, grapples with losing his son in the call of duty, his words carry the weight of a leader burdened by grief yet strengthened by resolve. Standing tall before his comrades and colleagues, he speaks of Alex with pride, sorrow, and unwavering determination. My fellow officers, friends, and comrades, Bishop begins, his voice steady despite the pain etched in his eyes. Today, we gather to honor the memory of my son, Lieutenant Alex Serbos, a brave soul who gave his life in service to our cause. With each word, Bishop recalls the moment he watched his son follow in his footsteps, a sense of pride swelling in his chest as Alex embarked on his journey to uphold the values of duty and honor. Alex was a son, a brother, and a friend to many Bishop continues, his voice tinged with emotion. But above all, he was a dedicated officer, a true exemplar of the values we hold dear. As memories of Alex flood his mind, Bishop speaks of the joy and laughter they shared, as well as the challenges they faced together. He recounts the countless missions they embarked on, the battles they fought side by side, and the unbreakable bond forged between them through years of service and sacrifice. And now, as we mourn his passing, we must also remember the legacy he leaves behind Bishop declares, his voice rising with conviction. For Alex may be gone from this world, but his spirit lives on in each of us, a guiding light in the darkness of uncertainty and doubt. With a solemn nod to his comrades, Bishop concludes his speech, his words echoing in the hearts of those who stand before him. And though the pain of loss may linger, he knows that Alex's sacrifice will never be forgotten, a testament to the courage and dedication of those who serve. As Regina Lance, Alex's girlfriend and future wife, stands before her colleagues and loved ones, her heart heavy with grief, she finds the strength to speak of the profound loss she has endured. My dear friends Regina begins, her voice trembling with emotion, today we gather to honour the memory of the love of my life, Lieutenant Alex Serbos, who gave his all in service to our cause. Regina's memories of Alex flood her mind with each word, a kaleidoscope of shared moments, dreams cherished, and love that knew no bounds. She speaks of their laughter-filled nights, their whispered promises, and the unbreakable bond that held them together through war trials. Alex was more than just a partner to me, Regina continues, her voice choked with tears. He was my confidant, my rock, my everything. And now, with his passing, a part of me feels lost forever. As Regina struggles to compose herself, she speaks of the dreams they had shared, the future they had envisioned, and the plans they had made for a life together. But even in the face of unimaginable loss, she finds solace in the memories they created and the love that will endure beyond the confines of time and space. And though Alex may no longer be by my side, his spirit lives on in the depths of my heart, Regina declares, her voice steady with resolve. And I vow to honour his memory by carrying forth his legacy, by living each day with the same courage and determination that defined his character. With a final nod to her comrades and loved ones, Regina concludes her speech, her words a testament to the depth of her love and the enduring strength of the human spirit. And though the pain of loss may never fully fade, she knows Alex's love will guide her through the darkest days, lighting her path with the promise of a future filled with hope and resilience. Fleet Admiral Jake Tillis honored the family with a Golden Wings of Service Award a flag of service and a Lieutenant Serbos insignia rank to Lieutenant Commander. Everyone cheered and cried. Lieutenant Commander is the fourth commissioned officer's rank in the Earth Navy and is equivalent to the rank of Major in the other armed services. Lieutenant Commanders typically serve as mid-ranking officers in Navy Vessels Executive and Command Divisions. Lieutenant Commander is the 19th rank in the Earth Navy, above Lieutenant and directly below Commander. Thank you for your service, Lieutenant Commander. Salute. Alex finds himself docked on a large ship he goes inside and people salute him. He smiles and salutes back. 
He walks down a long corridor, and the room is filled with soldiers cheering louder and louder. Someone is cheering and talking on the stage. They discuss their world's freedom and keeping their empire safe from the other world united against them. Everyone cheers for Alex to take the stage and give his speech. Alex took the stage and talked about how their people are united and will fight again, one that plans to take what is theirs and the freedom of their people. That called him the supreme leader. Alex found himself as the leader of many worlds with all the wealth of many worlds. As Alex was speaking, he saw a large mirror on the wall. He saw himself as the leader of the Garantian's empire. He was in total shock. Alex found himself in a situation that required quick thinking and wise decisions. He decided to use the strategy of undermining the empire's operations from within, taking advantage of his newly acquired position of authority. This involved subtly sowing seeds of dissent and rebellion among the Empire's ranks. Through careful planning and strategic manipulation, Alex worked to weaken the Empire's grip on power and ultimately bring about its downfall. To achieve this, Alex identified the Empire's weaknesses and exploited them. He used his insider information to identify areas where the regime was particularly vulnerable, such as supply chain disruptions, morale issues among troops, or dissent among high-ranking officials. During one incident, Alex uncovered that all the officers in the crowd had been lying to their subordinates, and many of the top officers were robbing and stealing from lower-ranking officers and soldiers. This revelation confused the top officers and mass confusion ensued on the large ship. Fighting started, and ships began firing at each other, causing chaos throughout the fleet. Alex's guards rush in to save him. They took Alex to a safe room. While there, Alex found his way to a computer and placed a code for all guaranteed ships to self-destruct regardless of location in five minutes. While all the infighting was taking place, Alex left the safe room and placed another code, sealing his guards inside. Alex rushed aboard his ship. Alex warped away from the fleet as he watched the entire guaranteed fleet explode. Alex faded into darkness. Lieutenant Serbos finds himself lost in the vast expanse of space amidst the swirling currents of time and space. Stranded far from home, with no hope of return, he embarks on an extraordinary journey of self-discovery and redemption. As he drifts through the endless cosmos, Lieutenant Serbos encounters civilizations on the brink of extinction, worlds ravaged by war, and beings in desperate need of aid. Despite his predicament, he cannot turn a blind eye to the suffering around him. With courage and compassion, he dedicates himself to helping those in need, offering assistance wherever possible, regardless of the personal cost. On his odyssey, Lieutenant Serbos forges improbable alliances with beings from diverse species and walks of life, all united by a shared mission igniting hope in the universe's most desolate corners. Together, they navigate the perilous depths of space, confronting unfathomable challenges and triumphing over seemingly insurmountable odds. As he voyages from one galaxy to another, Lieutenant Serbos acquires invaluable insights about sacrifice, resilience, and the true essence of heroism. Each encounter pushes him to his limits, compelling him to confront his fears and uncertainties. Yet he remains resolute in his mission to effect positive change in the lives of others, his unwavering commitment shining through. But as he helps one civilization after another, Lieutenant Serbos wonders if he will ever find his way back home. Despite the uncertainty of his fate, he continues to press forward, driven by an unwavering sense of duty and a deep-seated belief that his journey has a greater purpose. In the end, Lieutenant Serbos discovers that the true measure of his heroism lies not in his ability to find his way home but in the lives he has touched and the hope he has inspired along the way. And though he may never return to the familiar shores of his galaxy, his legacy will endure, a beacon of light in the vast darkness of space and time. Alex boards his ship and exiles, he closes his eyes. A voice comes. Welcome, Lieutenant Commander. You have faced danger without fear, and your skills proved invaluable. The ancients will keep watch over you. We ask that you accept the role of an ancient and honor us by accepting the blood of the ancient that we have given you. Please accept these wings of the ancient, our most potent weapon to the skies, the universe, and the heavens. Lieutenant Commander, we wish to thank you again. We look forward to your return as an ancient and to you sitting with us, as the first human to be an ancient. The skies went black, and a bright glowing appeared. 
Alex found himself in an asteroid field on an asteroid. There was a giant planet in the background. Alex woke up inside his emergency capsule and pressed his rescue beacon. A black fighter streaked above him. Alex said, okay, that was fast. Alex saw a black fighter streaking across the asteroid field. He thought it was Sam and Marshall, but he said that was fast. The pilot contacted Captain Heron. This is Captain Heron, the pilot said, sir. We had a beacon in the Victor field. I see an emergency capsule, sir. Captain Heron said, I hope this isn't another pranks. Captain Heron made his way out to the asteroid field. Captain was hot, being pulled away from his dinner. Heron said over the comms that this had better not be another prank. He landed his craft on the asteroid and walked toward the capsule carrying his giant flashlight. He approached the capsule and saw that the name read Lieutenant Serbos he found that strange. He walked slowly, thinking he would see the remains of the Lieutenant Serbos. Once he looked into the capsule, Alex waved at him. The captain jumped back to catch his breath. He called Fleet Admiral Tillis on private comms. Captain Heron, sir, this is Heron. I need to see you on board Apollo 1. We have an emergency. Captain Heron just ended the call without explanation. Fleet Admiral Tillis arrived on the Apollo at the landing dock. Captain Heron was waiting. Jake ran to Charles to see what the emergency was. Charles just gave the Admiral a salute and said, follow me, sir. Jake walked beside the captain through the large Apollo. The captain never said one word to Jake, he just kept walking. Later, the captain placed his hand on a scanner to unlock the door. The door opened to a high security area. The captain remained speechless and went into another classified top secret location. He and Jake walked down another corridor and stopped in front of a large room with a big glass window. The room had a privacy curtain around it. From the movements, you could tell there were people behind the curtain. Captain Heron pressed the button on the wall. The doctors and nurses behind the curtain pulled the curtain open and stood to the side. A hand started waving and the bed elevated up. Jake was stunned he didn't say a word, not a similil, nor a movement, and he did not react at all. Only a tear ran down his face, his brain was shut down. Alex continued waving and smiling. He gave Jake a big thumbs up. Jake said only one word to Captain Heron. How? How? Faith out. End of chapter 5. Faith in. Chapter 6. Fading in. Admiral Jake Tillis urgently summoned Fleet Admiral Serbos to Apollo 1, stressing the need for secrecy from Sandra and others. He revealed the existence of Alex's remains, a matter he deemed crucial for Serbos to handle. Tillis informed Serbos that he and Captain Heron would be waiting, with Lieutenant Jones ready to escort him. They then proceeded to discuss Alex Serbos's status with Captain Jackson. Jake asked Captain Jackson how he was. Jackson is in great shape and has a great attitude. We ran every test on him from toe to hair, blood work, breathing, blood pressure, and every test you can think of. This might shock you, but even a pregnancy test. Jake said, Jackson, you know he has been missing two months. How can he lie in a capsule alive for two months? Jackson, being a humorist, said he held his breath. But seriously, Admiral, there is no way I can answer that. Jackson said, I am sure Admiral Serbos is going to ask the same question. We can continue to run tests on him. Dr. Jackson asked, has anyone told him he has been missing for two months and was presumed dead? Charles said, no. I asked for no one to bring that matter up. Big Boss, having received a call from Jake, informed Sandra of the urgent meeting on Apollo 1. They shared a brief moment together before Big Boss departed to meet with Jake and Charles, leaving Sandra to process the news. Back on the Apollo, Jake asked Dr. Jackson. Jackson said no and walked off, but as he was about to walk through the door, he stopped. He looked back at Jake and Charles and said, Oh yeah, we did find one thing, however. Jake said, What's that? Jackson said he had grown an inch, six feet two to six feet three. That is odd. Jackson returns with his staff to continue running tests on Alex. Jake agreed. Later, Big Boss landed on Apollo 1. Lieutenant Jones saluted Big Boss and started walking to meet Jake and Charles. 
As Lieutenant and Big Boss were walking, she made a left turn, and Big Boss made a right turn, heading toward the morgue. The Lieutenant stopped and said, Sir, Admiral Sir Boss. Big Boss continued walking toward the morgue, and she repeated, Sir. He stopped, she said, this way. Big Boss turns around and walks to her. He thinks that Apollo is going through some renovations, maybe they move the morgue. Jake and Charles were standing in the corridor talking. Big Boss walked through the door and walked in and thanked Lieutenant Jones for escorting him. Big Boss spoke, and both men saluted him. Big Boss said, So what have you found? Jake nor Charles said a word. They walked down the hall back to the room with the huge glass window, and they looked in the room again. Big Boss walked behind them and said, Were there any remains? Jake pointed to the window. Big Boss looked shaken and fell against the big glass window when he saw Alex waving at him. Big Boss fell to his knees and said, What is this? Alex saw Big Boss fall. Alex pulled all the wires off his chest and arms and ran to the window, looking down at Big Boss. Alex yelled, Dad, Dad. Are you okay? Jake and Charles pulled Big Boss up. Big Boss leaned against the window at Alex. Big Boss was in shock and crying. Alex said, I am okay, Dad. Big Boss gave Alex a thumbs up, and Alex repeated the thumbs up back. Big Boss asked how, and Charles and Jake said they had no idea. Big Boss shook his head. Alex asked where Mom, Sharon, and Regina were. Big Boss said, I love you. Alex said, I love you too. Big Boss asked when I could see him, Jake said in the morning. The doctors and nurses run every possible exam on him. The nurses came up and put Alex back to bed. Alex waved at his dad. Big Boss waved back. Jake said, let's go get a cup of coffee. After making it to the dining room, the three men sat. Jake said, Bishop, I know this is a shock. It's been a shock to all of us. We have no answers. Charles ordered coffee for everyone. Jake said to give yourself a moment. We are all still in shock. Jake said, how do you want to handle this? After Big Boss calmed himself, he said, let us give this a few days to sort out. Jake said to call Sandra, and I will call Laura. We will tell them we were staying over on the Apollo tonight. We can talk to Alex first thing in the morning. Big Boss said, yeah, let's do that. I'll meet you back here around 7 a.m. In your office, Jake said, sure. The three officers had their coffee and called it a night. Big Boss tosses and turns all night and sleeps very little. He got up at 5.30 a.m. Bishop called Sandra. He asked her how she was feeling. She said she had a dream about Alex and couldn't sleep. She stated how much she missed him. Bishop said he did as well. He asked how Sharon... Sandra said she was okay. She is trying to smile more, but she still misses her brother. Sandra also said Regina is still broken. She looks strong, but I can feel her sadness. Bishop said, I love you and will see you later when I get home this evening. They both kissed over the comms. Bishop later met with Jake in his office. Jake said, good morning, Bishop, come right in. Jake asked his assistant if he could bring them coffee. Both sit at the table with their coffee. Bishop, do you have any idea how we approach this? Well, let's hug him and rejoice with him. Let him talk. We must ask him questions from there. Bishop Charlie and Jake arrived in Alex's room. Alex greeted the three men with a salute and hugged Bishop and Jake for at least two minutes before they released their grip on each other. The four of them sat at the table in Alex's room and exchanged good morning greetings. Captain Heron spoke first and asked Alex how he was feeling after the recent scare. Alex replied that he was feeling great, except for a slight headache which the nurse said might have been caused by the impact of the escape pod. Apart from that, he was doing fine. Alex asked if everyone was worried about him. Can you please tell them that he is fine and will be back soon? Alex asked about his mom and Regina and he said he would call them later. Charles asks if he recalls the incident. When Alex inquired about what had hit him, he wondered if he was under attack. He could only remember a beam he had ejected upon seeing a bright flash, 
causing him to black out. Charles asked how long you were out. Alex said, I have no idea until you show up. Alex said to Charles, you get there in a flash. Alex said, I might have been out a long time for you to get there. He told Charles the first was very happy to see you and said I was happy to be alive. Thank God, Alex said. Both Bishop and Jake were listening and were still shocked to hear Alex's story. Charles said, Alex, would you mind talking with another doctor later today? He is just part of the exam. Alex said, sure. Charles asked Alex, you only recalled being blacked out from the ejection until you saw me? Alex said, yes. Charles looked at Bishop and Jake. They looked back at Charles. Charles looked back at Alex. He said, Alex, I like got you to look at the videos from Lieutenant Commander Gills and Smith. Alex said, Lieutenant Commander, those two shouldn't be cadets and started laughing out loud. Charles said, I'd like you to look at the videos from both Gills and Smith. Alex saw the videos, and he looked at them over and over. Alex never saw his escape pod ejected. Alex looked around the room and asked, how? Big Boss looked at Alex and said, son, you've been gone for two months. We had your memorial. Jake said we had your celebration and honored and promoted you to lieutenant commander. Alex looked confused and cried, no way. Mom, Sharon, and Regina think I am dead. Alex dropped his head and asked, what are we going to do? Charles said, once we finish that last exam in a few hours, it will be up to your dad and Admiral Tillis. Alex looked around the room and asked, how? Big Boss looked at Alex and said, son, you've been gone for two months. We had your memorial. Jake said we had your celebration and honored and promoted you to lieutenant commander. Alex looked confused and cried, no way. Mom, Sharon, and Regina think I am dead. Alex dropped his head and asked, what will we do? Charles said, once we finish that last exam in a few hours, we will hold you until your dad and Admiral Tillis give us clearance for your release. For now, this is classified. Alex said he understood. Charles said he would check back in once the last exam was complete. Captain Heron stood up, saluted, and left the room. Big Boss said, Jake and I have spent moments telling parents about the loss of their child. We never once had to tell a parent your child was found alive. Jake said, well, that's not quite true. Remember those kids in the jungle, they both laugh. We have returned to the exam room with Alex, Big Boss, and Jake still talking. Alex seems relieved and shares, I'm glad to be back and caught up on everything. I just saw everyone a day ago in my mind, so I'm sure they missed me more. I deeply apologize for the pain you all went through, thinking you had lost me. Jake is overcome with emotion and tears, while Big Boss adds, no one could eat or sleep. We all tried our best to move on, but I don't think we truly did. Your mother and sister are a mess and poor Regina feels her world is over. Alex said, I am sorry. Alex said it was lovely to know so many people cared about me and gave me a wonderful celebration. At that point, a nurse came in to take Alex to his last exam. Big boss, due to all this, how do you feel about us releasing him for flying for a while? Alex said he agreed and that he might understand. Big boss. Alex always wanted to fly, Jake said. I know. Big boss. So where do we put him? Alex responded that he would like to have him under my command. Big boss, said. I like that. Thank you. Jake said he would talk to Alex about the changes. Big boss said, so how will we break this to the ladies? Jake said it the way we learned about it hopefully less shockingly. Big Boss said I think we should call them up. Send a military air taxi down for me. Sandra should be home. Sharon's classes aren't till later today, so they both are home. Regina is in the office. I will have a press conference tomorrow morning. Captain Heron met with Big Boss and Jake again, informing them that Jake passed the last exam, which was a truth exam. It was 100% on that test as well. Big Boss told Charles that he and Jake decided to inform the family today and the media tomorrow. Charles said he agreed with the decision.
Big Boss said I would like for you to be there. Jake returned to the room. Jake pats Alex on the shoulder, saying he has some calls to make and will see him later. Charles smiled at Alex and left the room as well. Big Boss told Alex how emotionally stressed and relieved all this had been to him. But his heart is at ease and pleased to have his son again. He said many people don't get this kind of opportunity. Jake and I thought it best to end all the confusion for you. Your mom, the family, and your friend, Regina. It's time to get back to normal. Your mother, Sharon, Regina, Jake's family, Sam, and Marshall will be here later this afternoon. I am sure they won't know why. Once they think we are all coming together for something for you. I understand there will be some emotion, but I don't remember everyone's reaction. Regina has been so damaged. You know your mother talks a lot. She hasn't been herself. I will speak to everyone. Alex said they didn't have to come to me. I will be near when they come looking for me. Hours later, everyone arrived at the Apollo and was escorted to a conference room. Big Boss Jake, Captain Heron, and his recovery team awaited in the room. Big Boss and Jake hugged their wives. Big Boss asked everyone to have a seat. Big Boss spoke of Alex. Big Boss said that it had been two months, and it was hard to explain why we hadn't found Alex's body until now. Everyone started crying and was happy to recover. Big Boss said he would let Captain speak about the recovery. Captain Heron addressed the audience and explained the challenge of finding the lieutenant's body after two months. He was the first one on the scene, and I saw him. Then, the emergency team brought him in, and the doctor conducted a thorough examination, running every possible test. Big Boss followed up with Captain Heron and expressed his intention to speak with the media the next day. He then asked if anyone would like to see Alex's remains. Sharon stood up and said, Daddy, I think we have all suffered enough over the months, and no more suffering is necessary. Let Alex rest in peace, Big Boss agreed with Sharon and said Alex needed to be at peace. Big Boss mentioned that the other night Jake called him about an emergency on the Apollo and mentioned something about Alex's remains. When Big Boss arrived, he was shocked to see Alex's body laughing and talking. Everyone was taken aback and repeated, Alex is alive. Big Boss confirmed that Alex was alive and well and the room went wild excitedly. Sam and Marshall saw Alex blow up, so everyone was asking how he could be alive. Regina, who had been in the room, ran out crying and saw someone standing in the middle of the hall. She couldn't tell who it was due to the distance and her tears, but as she got closer, she realized it was Alex. She ran towards him, yelling and repeating his name, and they kissed and cried together. As Alex and Regina were kissing, Everyone rushed out of the conference room to see Alex alive. Sharon and her mom dashed out of the room when they lost Regina. Sharon screamed and called Alex's name with joy and laughter. She hugged Regina and Alex, crying. Sandra made it next and joined the big hug. It was a moment of overwhelming joy. Later, Sam and Marshall participate in the big hug, following the Jake family. Big Boss and Jake join as well into this big crying joyful in the hug. Captain Heron made it up to the big crying huddle and said, Okay, you can take him home. Everyone starts even louder. Alex looked at Regina and asked her if she would marry him. Regina said yes, a million times, and it's yes. Everyone cheered and left for home. A week later, Alex and Regina got married, and three months later, during a family event, they announced that they were expecting twins. So the Serbos clan continues to grow. This ends Chapter 6. Fade Out. Chapter 7. Fade In. Alex has recently taken on a new role on the spacecraft Apollo 1. He will report directly to Admiral Jake Tillis and oversee the bridge communication. On a personal note, I am thrilled to announce that Alex and Regina are married and are expecting twins. However, Alex has been experiencing some intriguing changes in his body that we do not yet fully understand. These changes are significant and transformative, adding a layer of mystery to his life.
During his time on the spacecraft, Alex stumbles upon a peculiar pair of fly wings, a discovery that piques his curiosity. These wings, which he now keeps as a talisman, seem to hold a deeper significance. It's worth noting that Alex is not alone on his journey and has a trusty android companion named Dexter. Keep an eye on him, as his role in the story will unfold later. Meanwhile, the research center is on the brink of achieving several significant milestones. All ten of the Apollo Battle Station craft have reported to Kepler, with five of them having been refitted for battle stations. Kepler is home to a population of over 500 billion. Additionally, Earth is building another ten Apollo spacecraft to head to the Trappist solar system. The Trappist project, a crucial step in our space exploration, will be much faster now that everyone has learned about the Kepler system. To keep himself occupied, Alex has recently acquired a small shop, a personal project he shares with his family. To assist him in this endeavor, he has invested in a state-of-the-art space android named Dexter as a companion. This android, a testament to Alex's passion for all things space-related, is a valuable addition to his shop. Alex's love for space extends beyond his work on the Apollo station. Alex met Regina at the research building on his day off, and they had planned lunch together. When Alex arrived at Regina's office, they greeted each other with a hug and kisses. Alex asked how she and the twins were, and Regina said they were doing great. She then invited Alex to join her in the lab, and he happily accepted. Once in the lab, Alex spoke to everyone and they returned the greeting. Alex asked Regina how that cloaking suit was coming along. She said, I think we are close. Alex asked if he could see it. She said, sure, but I think you are too big for the suit. Alex and Regina walked over to the table. Alex looked at the table and said, may I? Regina said, yes, there is a restroom just around the corner. Alex took that suit and walked to the restroom. Alex put on the suit. Amazingly, Alex was entirely invisible. He walked from the restroom back to Regina and hugged her. She screamed out loud. Said Regina she couldn't see him. Regina screams it works, the suit works. Everyone ran over to Regina station. They all asked, where's Alex? Alex removed the top portion and appeared with half in suit. Everyone was celebrating the outstanding achievement. Regina had done. One of Regina's male researchers asked to try on the suit. Alex returned to the bathroom, removed the suit, and gave it to the other researchers. He tried that suit on, but nothing happened. Alex tried again and became invisible again. Everyone in Regina couldn't understand and were confused but were happy to see it worked. The other researchers were still in shock and amazement. Alex asked Regina, can we go to lunch now? Regina and Alex arrived at the restaurant where they had a reservation and were seated at their table. Regina said, I am just amazed about the suit, but everyone is wondering why it only worked on you, Alex said. Well, I am a remarkable man to a special lady and kissed Regina. Alex said, but I have no clue. It is strange, I admit. Regina said, have you noticed you've become more extensive and taller? Your clothes look a little tight. Alex said, I have noticed about his clothes you have been cooking so well. Alex said to Regina. They laugh. Alex asked Regina if that suit was the same suit she had at home. Regina said, yes, it is. Alex said his meal was good and asked Regina what dinner was for that night. Regina said, we still need to finish eating lunch, and you asked about dinner. Regina said you should cook tonight. Alex said, well, if you are okay with eating burnt hot dogs. Regina said, well, it's a good thing they don't have hot dogs, so think of something else. And don't make me and the baby sick. They both laughed. Alex returned to work and told Regina he planned to join a gym that day. He also mentioned thinking about creating a small workout area in his shop. Regina thought it was a great idea, and they kissed before she went into the research building. Alex decided to check out a local gym to become a member. The trainer at the gym gave Alex a tour of the facility. Alex's physique became very noticeable after working at the gym for about a week. 
He had gained significant muscle mass, and his body weight had increased to 275 pounds and at 6A. Regina taught Alex to cook one-night ribeye steaks, potatoes, and asparagus. And asparagus. She showed him how to cut up the vegetables properly. Regina complimented Alex on his noticeable physique transformation, which made him look like a different person. They both laughed and then playfully touched each other's chests and stomachs. They laughed again and shared a kiss. Regina said, back to cooking. She started slicing the steak and showed Alex how to cut it. She gave him the knife and he was cutting and the knife slipped, cutting his hand very badly. Alex had injured his hand and was bleeding heavily. Regina panicked and suggested they should go to the emergency room. Alex held his hand tightly and Regina ran to the bathroom to get a towel. She returned to the kitchen and gave the towel to Alex, who wrapped it around his hand and sat on the couch. Regina urged Alex to go to the hospital, but he refused. When Regina asked him what was wrong, Alex remained silent and kept the towel around his hand. Regina then removed the towel and was surprised to see that Alex's hand had healed without marks or scars. Regina looked in total shock. She asked Alex if he saw this, and Alex said yes. Regina said why. Alex said I do not know. Alex and Regina finished their meal and went to bed. They talked more about the incident and left for work. Alex headed to the Apollo and Regina returned to a research center. Later that day, Regina called Big Boss and asked to see him. He said he was free all day and could come any time. Regina showed up at the Big Boss office ten minutes later. When she knocked on Big Boss's office, he opened the door. Regina's face looked concerned. Big Boss said, are you okay? Regina said, I don't know. They both sat at the table. Regina started talking. Regina said, I am concerned about Alex. Big Boss said, please tell me. Regina asked Big Boss if he had seen Alex in the past two weeks. He said, we talk every day, but I haven't seen him. Regina said Alex weighed 275 pounds. Big Boss said he knew about it. She said Jake told him, and he said Alex told him he joined the gym. Regina told Big Boss that the cloaking suit worked. The Admiral was excited about that. Regina said, but it only works for Alex. Big Boss said, what? Are you serious? She said, yes. Everyone in the lab tried the suit on. Big Boss sat back in this chair. Regina said another thing last night. Alex cut his hand really bad and blood was all over the counter and floor. She ran to the bathroom and got a large towel. She said, I gave him the towel and told him we needed to go to the emergency room. But Alex just sat there on the couch. He looked a little shocked, not saying a word, Regina said. I looked at his hand, which was fully healed with no marks. Regina followed up and said, I took the bloody towel to the lab this morning. Alex's blood work tested 100% normal. He is so perfect, too perfect. Big Boss instructed Regina to hold on for a minute while he picked up the phone and called Jake. He put the call on speaker mode so Regina could hear the conversation. Big Boss asked Jake if he had seen Alex, to which Jake responded that Alex had gone to the lab and was planning to see Dr. Jackson. Big Boss said thank Jake before ending the call. He then assured Regina he would update her when Jake called him back. When Regina expressed her worries about the babies, Big Boss comforted her by saying that he had faith that everything would be all right. Later that night, Regina and Alex were lying in bed and talking. Regina mentioned to Alex that she had noticed some things but didn't see them as something wrong with him. Instead, she saw him as very special, just like she told him a long ago. He said he knew and would always protect her and his family no matter what, and would never put them in danger. She said, I know. He said, I worry about you, our twins, Regina said, we both do. I trust you with my life and our children. I will give all my life to you and them. They kissed and slept cuddled up. The following day, Alex asked Regina if he and Dexter could help her with the cloaking suit. She said, why not? Alex said I would pick him up at my shop. They kissed, and Regina headed to the research center. Alex sat and thought about everything that had happened to him for the past four months. Now he started thinking outside the box. He went to his closet, 
opened one of the drawers, and pulled out his unique wings, which he called his lucky charm. He then left for his shop. Once at the shop, he spoke to Dexter the android. Dexter does great things working around Alex's shop and can fix many things. Dexter is an advanced level android. Alex asked Dexter if he would like to hang out with him and Regina for the day. Dexter said, sure. Alex thinks with an open mind, but it is strange. He places his lucky charm around Dexter's neck. Alex stepped back and said to Dexter, so how do you feel? Alex looked into Dexter's eyes. Dexter's eyes went from blue to white. Dexter said hello, Lieutenant Commander Alex Serbos, callsign Blackhawk. Alex had a flashback and held his head. Alex looked into Dexter's white eyes and said, I have heard that before. Dexter said, I am your AI. Alex said, you are an android. Dexter said, I am AI Dexter. So Alex said, if you're an AI, drive me to the research center where Regina works. Alex and Dexter left. Alex sat in the passenger seat and Dexter drove to the Apollo Research Center. Alex told Dexter, you drove pretty good. Dexter said, thanks. Dexter and Alex made it to Regina's office. Alex and Dexter sat in her office. Regina said, okay, you two are here to work. Dexter and Alex stood up. Regina looked at Dexter and Alex and she said, I thought Dexter's eyes were blue. Alex said, are you sure about that? Dexter said, I am AI Dexter. Regina said, you are what? Alex said he was testing the jokes I had programs for him. Alex expressed Dexter's desire to become more human, but Alex knew he couldn't share this with anyone. Dexter, who was initially a simple android, now had AI abilities gained through Necklace. As a result, he was no longer just an android, but something more. Alex instructed Dexter to keep this information to himself and to focus on being helpful and productive. Regina asked what the two were talking about. Alex said, oh, just another joke. Regina, Alex, and Dexter left the office. Regina toured Alex and Dexter around the center. Dexter carefully observes his surroundings. He heard the sound of rifles being tested. Regina said, there is more, but let us take a look at the cloaking suit in my lab. She said, being pregnant, I can't do it like I used to, and laughed. A few hours later, Alex told Regina, let's grab some lunch. She said, sure. She went into her office and made a call. Regina exited her office and said she was ready and Big Boss was joining them. Alex said great and told Dexter to continue observing the place. As Alex and Regina reached the lobby, Big Boss parked outside with his driver, waiting on Regina and Alex. Big Boss asked Regina and Alex how they were doing. They said very well. Big Boss said I wanted to take you two to lunch so Alex doesn't have to cook. They all started laughing. Big Boss said to Alex, you have really grown. Alex said just working out and Regina, fantastic cooking. Alex said he needed his strength to carry two babies. Big Boss said, speaking of babies, Sandra and Sharon want you two over for the weekend. And we mean the whole weekend starting Friday. Sandra said that's an order. Everyone laughed, made it to the restaurant, and enjoyed meals and laughter. About 90 minutes later, Regina, Alex, and Big Boss returned from lunch. Upon their return, they noticed Chief of Science and Research, Chief Medical Doctor. Lakteva McHale, standing alone in front of the research center, clapping her hands, which seemed odd. The trio walked up to Chief Medical Doctor. Lakteva McHale. Big Boss asked her why she was standing outside alone, clapping. Mikhail responded by asking who said I was a long admiral. Suddenly, about 30 researchers uncloaked and appeared from nowhere, cheered in delight. Mikhail then said to Regina, you did it, Regina. You and your assistant pulled it off. Regina was surprised and asked my assistant, Mikhail, this was just one of the milestones we made today. Dexter finally appeared next to Regina. Mikhail said, there is your assistant now. Everyone applauded. Mikhail turned to Dexter and said, We didn't catch your last name, sir. Dexter smiled when he heard himself being addressed as sir. My last name is Sir Boss. Big Boss turned to Alex and said, Wait till your mom hears about this. Regina asked, 
What was the other milestone, Chief Macau replied. We now have a rifle that can fire at five targets simultaneously and has the ability to return to the target if missed. This will be groundbreaking for the special ops units. Big Boss said that would be groundbreaking for all troops. Mikhail said the development of the new rifle firing will also be tested to see if we can implement this design on our ships. Big Boss said this would change all battle tactics. Before Mikhail returned to her office, she said, There are lots of Sir Bosses around here. Big Boss just smiled. Chapter 8 will take us on a journey with Apollo 1 deep into the cosmos. You are going to learn things about Alex that he doesn't know yet. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. This ends of Book 2.